The Ramban's Jewish intimacy teachings has transformed countless families already. But the question is, what do we learn so far and where are we going? First, the Ramban is telling us, take that inner animal and change it, exchange it, prepare it, turn it into an angel. Okay, great. Now that I did, I mean, I'm starting to ask myself, why? Why did I do all of this for? What am I going to get out of it? Now, of course, there's the spiritual preparation, the mental preparation, the physical preparation. I mean, am I going to get anything out of this? Because that evil inclination within me is telling me, let that animal out. I think it's more fun. Tonight, we're going to talk about those fruits, the fruits that you end up producing as a result of Jewish intimacy according to the Torah. On the other hand, the fruits you don't want to produce. And most extraordinary are the last two stories, real life stories, not just from the Gemara, which you're also going to hear, but also from life in recent generations. Two of the most extraordinary stories you're ever going to hear. Stories that will literally make you want to have Jewish intimacy your whole life, even more so, it's going to want to make you publicize Jewish intimacy everywhere because of what's on the line and how much you could benefit enjoy it apply it share it and don't forget the whole purpose of everything is to be holy we are back on our tuesday night series regarding jewish intimacy the holiness of jewish intimacy uh we've uh this is lecture number 22 in the series anyone that uh hasn't watched any of the ones before or hasn't really watched the whole series before i certainly recommend that you go to the beginning and watch all of them you could still watch the one tonight without watching the ones before but you're certainly going to be uh find yourself clueless about certain things if you don't watch the ones from before or at the very least you'll uh, uh be missing on a lot of information uh tonight's show will be for the Refuah uh, Shlema, for Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Avi Mori David ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and uh, the Atzlacha Rabba for all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides, all of the people that support us, donate on our uh, websites and uh, send uh, their resources, their times, their skill sets, very, very much appreciated for everybody that's behind us, that's helping us continue to do all the wonderful things that uh, the organization is doing, all the different shiurim, Baruch Hashem, in different languages. Uh, so uh, with that said, we have obviously uh, lots of stuff going on. There's a uh, huge shipment of books, uh, Baruch Hashem, that is uh, on the way right now to uh, Israel and the United States, my new book. Uh, 25,000 copies are on the way. Uh, and anyone that wants to be a partner in that uh, free distribution of 25,000 copies of the book uh, in Israel and the United States is uh, more than welcome to donate on our website. You can go to bhtorah.org or to our regular website, bezatashem.org. Uh, or you could donate on Facebook under the uh, right pressing the button, whatever you want to do. If you really want to donate, you'll find a way. There's plenty of things that, plenty of ways that uh, people can reach us. Uh, aside from that, we also have. Rabbi Ephraim's new book, uh, that's actually being printed right now. Uh, the, uh, this book is uh, certainly a huge project, an undertaking that took several years to put together. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, we're doing now, we're printing the uh, Hebrew copy, 25,000 copies of that. Uh, and uh, we're looking uh, actually to get this book translated. We already started Bo Hashem. Uh, we have about 20% of it translated to English. But it's very, very costly and very time-consuming uh, to, uh, to translate high level of work. So anyone that wants to be a partner uh, in this book could uh, reach us uh, or you could simply donate on the website. Uh, we're hoping to have this uh, English version of it uh, done within, uh, you know, uh, probably the next, uh, let's say, uh, 6 to 12 months. And hopefully this time next year or sooner, have it already distributed everywhere, uh, Bezat Hashem. It'll be the first uh, book by Rabbi Ephraim in English. So that's coming soon, Bezat Hashem. Uh, so there's a lot of other things to do, but let's just get to it. The uh, series, 
We haven't talked about it in a long time. Jewish intimacy, certainly a, uh, uh, a hot topic uh, out there when people are trying to do good uh, and trying to run away from all of the upside down world uh, that we live in, where I think there's more and more people are waking up to realize that uh, the world is becoming more and more vile, more and more disgusting. The things that people simply ignored and just, you know, let it pass or simply didn't care and sometimes even befriended are, uh, you know, knocking at everybody's doorsteps, everybody's, uh, everybody's house, and they don't like it when it's coming to their kids' kindergarten and their kids' schools. And uh, everyone knows what I'm talking about, this whole LGBTQ uh, uh, B uh, virus that's everywhere uh, and certainly this is something that uh, 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 you know people are uh, dealing with in one way in some ways people are dealing with it uh, by just simply uh, ignoring it and there's others that are uh, realizing that there's no way we can ignore it the truth is uh, when it comes to Jewish intimacy uh, one of the things that the Ramban has taught us is that we are a world of difference a world of difference between Jewish intimacy that is in accordance to the Torah versus whatever the world calls their uh, relationships, uh, whether they call it intimacy or they call it the uh, sexual or they call it whatever they want to call it. Anyone that has watched even one complete lecture from this particular series uh, knows that there is literally a world of difference between what Jewish intimacy is and what the world uh, is in essence uh, uh, practicing now the the beauty of it is apparent the uh, the pleasure of it is only something you could enjoy uh, if you actually do it because pleasure is not something that I can teach you I can tell you that it's certainly much more pleasurable I can tell you that it's certainly better for you I could tell you that it certainly has its uh, a huge amount of uh, both physical spiritual emotional psychological rewards that are beyond the scope of this uh, of this lecture but there are certain things that you simply have to see or feel in order to believe so the evil inclination that is within each and every single one of us is automatically coming to every single person that's watching this series and saying, why should I do this? Okay, so it sounds good, but I kind of feel good. It looks good, but I'm okay. Like, why do I need to invest all this extra time to prepare myself spiritually, to prepare myself physically, to prepare myself psychologically, just to perform the same act I've been doing, you know, for most of my life. Like, why do I need preparation? Why can't I just do everything? Now, of course, we've talked about the benefits. Uh, you know, we've talked about the fact that it's to, to, you know, for a person to achieve this, they have to remove their inner animal, and in essence, turn it into an angel. Uh, and, you know, and this actually does end up being much more pleasurable, much more enjoyable, and certainly much more rewarding. But the evil inclination within each person is to say, yeah, but it's so hard, or it sounds so hard. So the first thing I could tell you is a reminder. Just because you can't do everything that the Ramban is teaching us doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. Meaning that it's not a take it all or nothing type of approach. No one can do all of it on day one or day two or even day 300. Everyone has to grow in, in increments. So you have to start somewhere. If that means that, you know, it's a uh, uh, not eating right before it. If that means a uh, specific time of the day. If that means uh, frequency or time of the day. If that means a... Uh, um, Obviously, uh, preparing yourself spiritually, praying before all, you know, there's many things that we've discussed. All, we've also discussed medical aspects or benefits uh, for Jewish intimacy or, or from, for, you know, from the Jewish sages where uh, people that have uh, different uh, medical problems performing or, or, or lasting. Uh, in the previous uh, couple of lectures, we've discussed those as well. Different vitamins, different things that a person can do. But at the end of it all, the naysayer, either within us or around us, is still going to argue and debate and say, 
who does this? Why should I do this? Why should I invest so much time into changing the intimacy in my home? Why should I do this in such an in, in such a fashion where literally you have to prepare for the intimacy that's going to happen later in the week, in the beginning of the week. You may have to prepare it at the beginning of the month. You have to prepare for it for months. Like, why? Why does a person even need to do all of this? Why does a person need to remove or exchange and transform their inner animal into an angel? What is the benefit of all of this? So, if the evil inclination tells you this, the first response is that, well, it's really not that hard if I don't look at the whole picture and just look at the parts that I can handle. That's the first thing. So again, like I said, if even if you can't do everything, it doesn't mean you don't have to do anything. So there are certain things that are easier than others. Time of the day, you know, food, you know, certain things that are relatively easy that a person could apply to their life and, and certainly get benefits. But the other thing that a person needs to know is that you get what you pay for. Not just the statement that everybody likes to uh, uh, say, uh, but in essence, the, the Mishnah in Masechet Avot uh, says the reward is based on the difficulty, meaning that the more difficult a spiritual task is, the, the more difficult, the more you... you uh, try harder in your servitude of Hashem, in your cleaving to Hashem, in your yearning for Hashem, praying to Hashem, learning about Hashem. The more difficult that endeavor is, that journey is for you, the more reward you're going to get, not just in heaven, but in even in this world. So if a person wants good fruits, the difficulty has to increase so although the evil inclination is going to tell you it's simply too difficult to change what i've been doing what i feel is normal here tonight we're going to talk about the fruits we're going to talk about not just what kind of fruits you can get but actually remind you that you're actually doing it anyway meaning you're already investing into your fruits that you've already produced an endless amount and it behooves you to invest in them before they even come into the world because if you invest in preparation you won't have to spend to rescue now the ramban has told us in the previous lectures that he brings the Gemara he brings the Gemara from Masechet Brachot page 5b that says That one of the sages is teaching. Rabbi Chama, the son of Rabbi Chanina, is teaching in the name of Rabbi Yitzchak that whoever places his bed from north to south will have male children. As the verse in Psalm 17, 14 says, And with your concealed treasures you will fill their belly. They will be sated with sons. Now, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak elaborates on this is that, and says that it's not only that if you position your bed from north to south, which again will remind you a little bit about what that actually means, uh, because there is two different opinions uh, or two different comments in essence about it. Uh, but Rav Nachman adds adds an, ex an extraordinary uh, addition to this. And he says, not only will you be sated with sons, but in addition, the additional benefit of having your bed positioned from north to south 
will be that the wife will not miscarry. The wife will not miscarry. As it is written in Genesis 25, 24, and his wife, uh, 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 and with your concealed treasure, you will fill their belly. That's the verse in, in Psalms. But also it says, uh, when her term to bear grew full, then behold, there were twins in her womb. This is in Genesis 25, 24. Meaning that the sages are teaching us that this positioning of the bed from north to south is not just going to benefit you that you'll actually have sons that could be Torah, Torah scholars but also a, there is an actual health benefit there is a protection for the woman and any woman that has gone through a miscarriage personally knows exactly what I'm talking about a man that had his wife go through a miscarriage knows exactly what I'm talking about it's although it happens although it's unfortunately at times even common uh, to certain women it's uh, more common than others it's nonetheless difficult as difficult can be and some even uh, get traumatized by it uh, traumatized to the point where they start fearing even having more kids or trying to have any more kids the some of the great sages that we had uh, dealt with these difficulties also you had the uh, Rav Tzion Abba Shaul one of the great sages in the previous generation he was the Chavruta of Rav Ovadia. Uh he had one son uh, but that's not because uh, they didn't want more. Is 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 Rabbanit had thirteen miscarriages, thirteen miscarriages. Shemachem. So just imagine the difficulty. But of course, it's everyone has what Hashem gives them for a specific reason. This doesn't mean that it's any less difficult. This doesn't mean that it's a, uh, a something that a person. Uh, could simply ignore but the point being is is that anyone that has had a miscarriage knows already exactly that if I can eliminate even the thought of, of a miscarriage being a possibility if I could not have a miscarriage and this is the price to pay to have Jewish intimacy in accordance to what the sages are teaching psh, that's already worth it even more, like if that's already enough of a that's already enough of a reward to get in order to do everything that we've talked about already for the last 20 lectures because a woman that understands what her body goes through until it finally has a baby and then you know the the, the letdown whether it's on the second month or the sixth month or the third month doesn't make a difference and of course, anyone that has had kids is a normal human being that uh, has, uh, sees what's happening in the world, how they're literally murdering millions of babies around the world each and every single year just because they haven't uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, exited the mother's, uh, the mother's body yet. And they think that it's just, uh, you know what, it's no big deal. It's just a apala, they call it in Hebrew, apala. It's like as if it fell, like it fell by itself. Like they don't tell you the real story as we showed in our Tikkun Abrit movie uh, that's on our channel for free to watch uh, the what what really an abortion is and how uh, gruesome and awful it is uh, literally uh, it's uh, taking a child and, and, and cutting it to a million pieces that's really what it is uh, no. and anyone that says no it's not a child it's still in the body it's a hundred percent a child once it's 40 days it's a hundred percent a child it has it has the body parts it has the eyes it has the soul it has everything now, of course, many people that do this fall into the trap of the Satan that convinces them to have abortions, don't realize what they're actually doing. Uh, this doesn't make it any less of murder, but nonetheless, uh, when a person uh, uh, has had a miscarriage, uh, hears that somebody else wants to have an abortion, literally, they, 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 they want to vomit because, they, what? How could you be possibly even thinking that way? You know how many women are, are, are literally willing to give their lung just to have a kid and you're just killing it? So this, of course, again, part of the journey towards Jewish intimacy is to 
sanctify our brains to remove all of the filth that society has taught us that has turned us into the animals we've become we're not supposed to be animals so when a person realizes that the sages are teaching us that one of the benefits that you will get from attaining jewish the holiness of jewish intimacy is that your wife will be protected from miscarriage now of course this doesn't mean that it's impossible to have a miscarriage as we just gave you an example one of the sages in the previous generation his wife had 13 miscarriages now others that do as well why because there's also a deen shemaim is a decree from heaven at times for certain righteous people to uh be the ones that fix certain souls from the previous world without bringing them to the world and this is a teaching of its own but the point being is is that the sages are teaching us and the rambam is bringing it that there is a health benefit there is a health benefit to doing this now what does it really mean as a reminder for you what does it really mean positioning your bed from uh north uh, from, from, uh, north to south the rambam unlike rashi he comments on it or clarifies it from a medicinal perspective rashi says this is really more of a mystical teaching where if your bed is literally positioned from north to south this will give you certain type of spiritual protection certain types of uh, positioning for the, the the couple that has significance that could yield children boys could yield righteous people ramban completely disagrees with this and says no no this has nothing to do with the mystical aspect of it this is really more of the medicinal aspect of it the health aspect of it why and he says because it's well known that severe cold comes from the north and severe heat comes from the south and the sages that had true wisdom knew that extremes are not good nor are they trustworthy rather a person needs to aim for towards moderation just like king solomon taught in ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 16 and 17 don't be overly righteous overly wise or or be a fool meaning don't be overly too much of certain things because extremes are not good so since a couple that positions their their uh, um puts themselves in a situation where their body's temperature uh are extreme at times this is not good for a lot of reasons if the male is too hot this either because he just ate an hour or two or less before intimacy this means that his body inside is heating up as part of the digestion that heating up within his body is also heating up everything else including his seed that seed that will go into his wife will be a warm seed and thereby will be a putrid ugly so in so many words almost like a deformed or injured seed that will produce deformed or injured fruits not physically deformed we're not talking about just because he ate uh, you know a, a hamburger five minutes before intimacy therefore his, his kids won't, won't have arms or legs no we're not talking about that we're talking about in a spiritual aspect of it the kid will be born with certain things that you prefer not to have whether it's being a uh, 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 obnoxious uh, slow learner a uh, person that has a uh, spiritual difficulties you know it simply doesn't connect to the torah doesn't connect to the truth atheistic uh, tendencies lgbtqb type of tendencies all types of things that you simply rather not have to deal with these types of things are more likely to come from those types of seeds that are 
coming purely from a place of warmth. Now, the same concept obviously applies with the woman, but it's not to the same extent because obviously the seed is in the man. So the Ramban has so far taught us different things that a person needs to do to not only prepare themselves spiritually, but also prepare themselves physically. And he told us, don't eat right before it. You know, you have to wait several hours so your body is no longer digesting. This could literally be six hours after you've completed eating. Uh, you know, a, uh, if that's not possible, then obviously the more the, me- the better. It should be at a certain time of the day. Middle of the night is best because that's usually when it's the environment is more of a uh, uh, on a cooler side rather than the warmer side. The point being is, is that the Rambana is telling us that this bed being north to south has nothing to do with actual physical bed, but rather the physical and spiritual temperature of the couple. And he says that if a person is born from a cold drop because the intimate act was in a very cold environment, he's always going to be a naive fool. But if the kid was born from a heated drop, either because it's physically hot or because the act itself is purely for lust and has nothing to do with a uh, uh, a sham or any mitzvah, it's purely animalistic. That's where the South also is uh, relating to. So this heated drop will always create an irritable, impatient person that's easy to anger. And that's why the parents have to prepare themselves both physically and spiritually before intimacy. Now, the Ramban continues and says, our sages have said that his wife will not miscarry, has an absolute principle. What does it mean has an absolute principle? That this is not just writing on the sand. This is an engravement on the wall. That this teaching entered our Talmud is not just like, oh, this is a nice suggestion, try it out. Good advice. You know, worst case scenario, you don't like the app, you try something else. No, no. This is engravement on the wall. If the sages put this into the Talmud, that this north and south matter is going to protect the wife from miscarrying this is an absolute principle and herein the the uh, the ramban says i will open for you gates of light you will know what our sages have said in the tractate of yomach page 82b regarding a pregnant woman who has smelled cooked food during yom kippur and wanted to eat it when it's forbidden to eat because we have to fast where rabbi akadosh told him to whisper to her that today is Yom Kippur, and she accepted the suggestion and refrained. And therefore, Rabbi said about her a verse from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Behold, before you were formed, I knew you. This is what Hashem said to Jeremiah. And this is the secret of placing of the beds between the north and south. While there was also another woman, that was pregnant, her friend, that at another time also smelled cooked food. And I'll explain all of this in detail after I finish. Her friend also smelled cooked food while she was pregnant and wanted to eat on Yom Kippur. Apparently this was a... sometime later. And they wished, they did the same thing with her. They whispered in her ear that today is Yom Kippur, but she didn't accept it and continued desiring to eat. This is what is meant by the direction of the south regarding her. It's cited in uh, in Psalm chapter 58, verse 4. The wicked are estranged already from the womb. It's known that the reason they miscarry is that the womb has become excited. 
and goes to one of the extremes, whether it be from the avidity for food or from lust, for warmth or for cold. For if the womb is moderate, she will never miscarry, just as the balance of the scales and the eye of judgment will not tilt to either side. So the Ramban is telling us this teaching of north and south is not a just a passive suggestion that only some people no no this is set into stone foundation of foundations if you implement it if you apply it to your life you certainly will benefit and if you ignore it don't cry for the fruits that you bring because you won't be happy with the results now some sages think some sages didn't agree with the Ramban not as far as what he said but that he's teaching it that he's teaching it you know people think today you know if you hear you know a certain sages name whether it's the Ramban or the Ramban or Rashi or Abi Akiva or any of the great sages from thousands of years ago hundreds of years ago or even ones that you know lived among us decades ago you hear big rabbis names and you think automatically that you know when they said something everybody listened when they said something everybody accepted and people don't realize how many wars they had to go through in order to bring the truth to the world and sometimes those wars were with their own peers and friends and you know sometimes even students family members and in fact, many of the great sages fought more wars than people can imagine in order to bring the truth to the world. And the Ramban is no different. Everyone is familiar with the famous debate that the Ramban had against Christianity in Barcelona. But what some people are not familiar with is that the debate that he had about teaching this in the Sefer called Dina de Chaye. Dina de Chaye in uh, Siman 45. He brings this up. And he brings up what the Bet Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo, wrote in the, uh, the Bedek Bait that he wrote in Yore De'a 154.2. That... Uh, quotes that Rabbeinu Yonah, which was a family member, I believe it was the nephew of the Ramban. Rabbeinu Yonah is quoted saying, you'll be blessed, this is in sarcasm, you'll be blessed for increasing the seed of Amalek. You'll be blessed for increasing the seed of Amalek. Why? He was unhappy about the teaching that is going to help non-jews have more kids now this sefer dina de chaya continues and says the rashba on the other hand the rashba wasn't of the same opinion as rabbi niona the rashba was actually of the opinion of the ramban where he says in siman 120 that the psak is not like Rabbi Yonah, that you're not supposed to help the Gentiles have kids. Opposite. The Rashba Paskins, that a Jewish doctor is permitted to help the Gentiles with medicine or whatever they uh, need medicinally in order to become pregnant. Meaning if there's a non-Jewish woman that has difficulty getting pregnant and she needs all types of help, the Jewish doctor is permitted to help her, no problem, whether it's, uh, you know, pills or whatever the, uh, uh, you know, the, the technology they have of that generation. Even though she's not Jewish, there's no problem to help her. Just like the Jewish maidservant is allowed to help deliver the non-Jewish babies. No problem. As we learned from the Ramban, he says, we, where do we, where, Rashba says, where do we get this from? Where do we have the permission to just say that, you know, Jews can help non-Jews? We learn it from the Ramban. The Ramban, that's what he paskined. 
In fact, Rav Ovadia, Allah Shalom, in Yabiyah Omer, Paskin is the same way. In fact, he adds to it, and he says that a Jewish doctor is allowed to violate Shabbat in order to save the life of a non-Jew. Whether it's to help a non-Jew have, uh, 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 you know, deliver a baby, or there has to be a surgery, meaning just like a Jewish doctor is allowed to uh, and has to uh, violate Shabbat in order to save a Jewish life, the same applies for the non-Jew. Why? For the sake of peace. For the sake of peace, because if the Jewish doctors will only help the Jews, this, this could create a problem worldwide that could put everybody at risk. So, where did this all uh, 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 start? The Ravadia uh, is bringing it obviously from Chachamim before. He, he brings many, many Chachamim. One of them is the Rashba. The Rashba himself brings uh, his source from the Ramban. But this does not mean that everybody agreed. Rabbein Yonah was on the other side. We don't pass him like Rabbein Yonah in this case, but there was again a different uh, opinion. So this again gives us a little bit a tidbit of of understanding that fighting for the truth doesn't mean that everybody's clapping for you the whole way there and throwing flowers on you no, no. sometimes fighting for the truth is literally a fight with some of the most precious people around you righteous people good people so when the ramban tells us that what i'm about to tell you is an absolute principle that I'm going to open the gates of light for you with this little bit of information, that means that this is a big deal. This is a big deal. You see, we've already learned from the sages that you have this protection. You have this protection if you work on yourself, develop yourself in order to achieve holiness in your intimacy. Where do we see this work? Why is it all worth it to do all of this, all of this extra effort? Why did the Ramban fight for this? What do we need all of this for? He says in the Gemara, Masechet Yoma, page 82b, it's a famous story. A righteous woman who her whole life observed Torah and Mitzvot. She was pregnant. Now, On Yom Kippur, everyone has to fast. Whether you're pregnant or not pregnant, young or old, you have to fast. Unless it puts your life at risk. If the life of somebody is at risk, then they have to, uh, uh, you know, they, they cannot fast. But generally speaking, most people, it's, you know, that have even health issues, whether it be uh, pregnancy or or it be uh, other health matters, Usually it's a potential risk, not an actual risk, like a, fa- a, a definite risk. So a pregnant woman has to fast, even on Yom Kippur. The problem is that sometimes pregnant women smell a certain smell which wakes up a uncontrollable urge to eat. Now this urge is not from the woman but rather from the baby. Now, what do you do if this happens on Yom Kippur? So the Gemara tells two stories. It said there was a certain pregnant woman who smelled food as she was going to the synagogue. On the way, somebody cooked something. That smell went in the air. Whether it was Gentiles that were cooking some non-kosher food, because they're allowed to eat non-kosher food, there's no need for a gentile to eat kosher food they were eating pig they were eating shrimp they were eating uh uh cow let me make a difference that creates a certain smell that smell impacted that baby after his mother smelled it so much so that the baby started moving around started creating problems and they had to come to the rabbi. Who? Rabbi Udanasi, the biggest rabbi of the generation, one of the biggest rabbis that ever lived. He's the one that put down the Mishnah on paper. 
where until him it was all orally transmitted orally since the time of Moshe Rabbeinu when he saw that the world is starting to deteriorate to the point where people are forgetting parts of the Torah he said we have to put this we have permission from the Torah to protect the Torah where even though until now we weren't allowed to write it we have permission from Hashem that in order to protect the Torah we have to uh, uh, we have to make certain uh, changes to some of the rules which the rule was that you're not allowed to write the oral Torah for the protection of the Torah but since that protection was no longer valid since th- that protection was causing its destruction he instituted that they have to put the oral Torah on paper now they went to him he said Rebbe we have a woman in our community she just smelled something and the baby is moving and it's obviously a big risk why because anyone that is uh, familiar with pregnancy that if the baby smells something and that urge is created if you don't feed that baby that food it could actually be a life risk both for the baby and the mother where the baby could actually if he doesn't get the food or she doesn't get the food that it's urging for as a result of that smell or that taste that was uh that happened that created that whole uh, uh reaction that baby can fall and die meaning it could be a miscarriage so we take these matters very seriously it really is a life risk so they went to Rebbe. Rebbe, please tell us, what do we do? And he says to them, go to her and whisper. Tell her husband or the maidservant or one of the people to come close to her and whisper in her ear. It's Yom Kippur. Not supposed to eat today. It's fast day. This is the secret. The whisper in her ear. It's not for her. It's for the baby. The rabbi says the people do they went to the woman she is obviously not feeling so good with what's happening since this urge came they whisper in her ear it's Yom Kippur it's a fast day not supposed to eat and all of a sudden these very simple words calm down the baby and the woman returned back to her good health they reported everything to Rebbe and Rebbe said, ah, that's good news. On him it's written, this baby, the verse in Jeremiah, where Hashem said about Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 5, before I formed you from the womb, I knew you. Meaning before you left the womb, I already made you holy. This baby that's in her is a holy baby. If he responded to that, he responded to that Torah instructions. By calming himself down, that's a holy baby. And that's exactly what happened. That baby was born, grew up, and became Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan, that's mentioned in every other page in the Gemara. Rabbi Yochanan. Just like Rabbi said, the Gemara. And so does the Ramban, says there was also another story where another pregnant woman had the same situation happen to her at a different time, perhaps even, you know, different food. Somebody was cooking on Yom Kippur or cooked already and the smell was in the air. A time that everybody's forbidden to eat and she smells it and the baby starts craving this food uncontrollably. They run to Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina tells them the same exact instructions as what Rabbi Akadosh did. He says to them, tell this, you know, whisper to this woman, it's Yom Kippur. It's a fast day. Now let's eat. Hopefully this will calm the baby down. They go, they do the same exact thing. They whisper. The baby doesn't calm down. As if nothing happened. The rabbi says, if the baby didn't calm down, feed her whatever she needs to eat. Whatever she craves for, feed her. Whatever she craves for, feed Why? Because it's a life risk. You're even allowed to feed her something that's not kosher. If that's what has to, that's, that's what she's craving. 
There's nothing you can do. It's a life risk. If you don't give this woman what the baby is craving, one or both of them could die. Feed her what she wants. And that's what they did. Now, although the life was saved, when they reported this to Rabbi Khanina, Rabbi Khanina said, There's a verse written about such babies in Psalm chapter 58, verse 4. It says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. This baby is reacting this way. It's a wicked baby. What does it mean it's a wicked baby? He didn't do anything yet. Meaning, the way that this baby was made was through a lustful act with no spirituality as a priority, meaning that he was as if a baby was created with the position of the South, the influence of the South, heat, and therefore that physicality from the parents had an impact on the seed, on the flesh that was created, on the fruit that was created. That's also lustful, that's also materialistic, that's also connected to physicality. Even in the womb. And that's why, just like the parents could not control themselves, the baby could not control himself either. And Rabbi Chayna says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. This baby is going to have certain deficiencies that are tended towards the acting of the wicked. And as the rabbi said, that's exactly what ended up happening. This baby, unlike the baby that was in the previous story that ended up being one of the righteous sages of Yohanan, this baby was a person named Shabtai, the hoarder of produce. What does it mean, the hoarder of produce? This Shabtai grew up, was a dishonest businessman who would do what's called price manipulation on the produce by making sure that he has control over certain produce and make the market think that there is a lacking, there is a shortage in order to manipulate the prices and make them make him more money. He would do things in order to benefit financially even though that meant hurting the public. And dishonesty in Judaism is one of the most despicable things in the eyes of Hashem. In fact, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 31a, says, as soon as a person dies and goes up to the bed of heaven, there are questions that are asked. The first question, out of all the questions that a person is asked, is not, how did you act in shul, how much Torah you learned, uh, were you generous? No, no, no. The first question out of all the questions that a person has asked at the judgment of heaven is, did you conduct your business with a recognition of the Creator watching you, with emuna? Did you conduct your business honestly? Why don't they ask them, did you go to shul? Did you pray really good? Because in shul, everybody can pretend to be honest. Everybody can pretend to be righteous. But in business, the way you are in business is the way you really are. If you are honest in business, then you are an honest person. If you're not honest in business, then you're a liar. Even if you're generous and give staka and give charity and uh, give your time. If you're dishonest in business, that means you're generous with other people's stuff. You're not really generous. It's like the generosity of the thieves where they're pretending to be generous because they're giving stolen money away. That's not generosity. So, Rabbi Hanina says, this baby that was made with the influence of the South, with the influence of lust and lust only, ended up becoming a wicked person that was 
a dishonest person in business that manipulated markets of produce so we see from here that the Ramban is bringing us not just Allahic proofs not just proofs from the Gemara or Talmud but actual real life proofs of the results of what happens here if a person listens or ignores and he says that this secret of placing the bed between the north and south that middle ground is what led the first baby to calm down while the bed being in a direction of the south meaning being influenced by lust and lust only is what caused the second baby to ignore the words of the people that were whispering in his mother's ear because it's known that the reason why women miscarry is because the womb becomes excited and goes on to one of the extremes whether it's because the misbalance came from smell of food or desire for lust or extreme cold or extreme heat these are all bad for the womb and today the orthodox jewish world takes these very seriously a woman that's pregnant needs to be very careful with how she behaves where she goes in order not to go to extremes extreme weather changes extreme changes are not good for the baby they're not good for the war uh, for the womb just like a scale the scale that has the mosnaim on both sides the scale has to be even has to be balanced the womb has to be balanced now the Ramban continues and says therefore when it occurred that she whom they whispered to and she did not accept for she disturbed the balance from the midpoint and the fetus was about to miscarry if she did not eat of the food that she smelled but then you're gonna say yeah but the pious one meaning the other woman and the hard baby that ended up being called the pious baby Rabbi Yohanan is what he ended up being he also smelled the food and he also reacted even though he calmed down still why what's the explanation for that he says if you ask also the pious smell the food know that even though she smelled it she would return to the midpoint of the equilibrium meaning that because the way that the baby was made was through holiness not just through a desire for lust not through ignoring the different principles that the Ramban has been teaching us about Jewish holiness but rather by trying to apply as many of them as possible because there's still a body there's still a lust there's still a desire no one is a angel so certainly that flesh that's produced that baby that's produced will still have desires so when it smells something it's still gonna you know move around and wants want this food but the difference is because the higher power that produced that baby was from the north from spirituality there was more spirituality that was the influence the motivator behind the reproduction of that baby that's going to help that baby calm down when you tell it hey it's not a good time to eat it's Yom Kippur but if he was an evil one and she smelled the food she will not be able to return to the midpoint of equilibrium 
for she has turned towards her animalistic nature and she could not be satisfied with the middle way meaning that even if she herself was righteous but the act between her and her husband was purely animalistic purely for lust purely for pleasure purely for physicality no consideration whatsoever to fulfilling a mitzvah no consideration whatsoever towards uh god nothing just like everybody that unfortunately in the world tries to give themselves a fix if that was the case even if she's righteous otherwise that baby wouldn't have been able to control itself and therefore that baby would have had to eat also and therefore understand the ramban and consider it well the time that a man should have marital union and thus you will merit sons worthy of being masterful deciders of the law see here the ramban is telling you take all of this into account apply as much of it as you can to your life and you will be rewarded not just in heaven for the mitzvah for the good that you're doing no no you'll actually be rewarded in this world you'll be rewarded in this world beyond your imagination why are you rewarded in this world beyond your imagination because you'll have good kids now what does that mean to have good kids what does it mean to have good kids you see human nature unfortunately does not understand good when people ask you why isn't heaven discussed in the Torah the in Torah but punishment is why because a person that is not already on a good path does not know what good is so if you described good to him he simply wouldn't know what to do with it on the other hand everyone knows suffering everyone knows bad so if you describe bad to a person that's on a good path or on a bad path you describe to them disease you describe to them hunger you describe to them death you describe to them all types of suffering you just desc- everybody understands that everyone understands it so to say to people listen you'll have good kids everyone says, you'll have good kids i like my kids my kids are good yeah now today there is a fear by both religious and non-religious alike that the end of the world is coming whether it be a war between the u.s and russia or war with the other countries or all of the countries everyone's scared of war there are many many different types of news outlets that make that their primary topic of discussion people are constantly afraid that the world is gonna literally go into such a uh, massive war financial digital uh 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 uh, yeah, um, physical actual you know uh, bombs and things of that nature like people are just like scared to death many times they're causing themselves to come scared to death now this is not a foreign topic to Judaism in fact this is a topic that is very widely discussed in the Torah in the oral Torah the written Torah the prophet Zachariah in chapter 14 in fact gives details of how the last war is going to be and he describes a biochemical war nuclear war but also biochemical he says that two-thirds of the world will be annihilated initially and the last third only some will survive some of the sages that comment on it say that this whole thing that he's describing is called gogu magog and it'll last only eight minutes the prophet Yechezkel, Ezekiel, in chapter 38, does the same thing, but with different words. Discusses the end of the world, discusses the last war, the war of Gog and Magog. Horrible, horrific description of what's going to happen in the end. Now, when it was written, we didn't have 
the bombs and the nuclear weapons and missiles and airplanes of today. You had catapults of rocks. You didn't even have bullets. How could you end the world in eight minutes with rocks? Of course, this is all prophecy of the end of days. And the end of days is going to have a war called Gogu Magog. We've discussed this in the past. And we're not going to go into the details of the end of the world. But we are going to go into the reality that the end of the world does not look pretty according to anybody's opinion. No one thinks that the last war will be a pretty fun war. Anyone that has read some history books that are not bias towards some type of mental cases philosophy but rather real history books rather real history and sometimes better yet even see real documentaries of what happened during the holocaust how they carry the bodies as if they're carrying fruits because there were so many of them death was in the air anyone that saw this read this doesn't look at war like people look at video games anymore anyone that reads about the wars of the past well before the holocaust what happened during the times of the bet Migdash, the first one the second one knows that they were even worse than the holocaust by a factor of a hundred knows that war there's nothing pretty about it. Now, as ugly as war is, the Gemara, Masechet Brachot, page 7b, says this, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, the very same Rabbi Yochanan that ended up being the righteous tzaddik, the baby, grew up years later. Rabbi Chaim Ivolojin brings the Gemara and says that he, Rabbi Yochanan, taught Torah for 40 years, till 120 years old. 40 years he was in business, 40 years he learned Torah, 40 years he taught Torah. This Rabbi Yochanan, our Torah, is on his shoulders. He says the following in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, which his Ilula is coming up in Lag Baomil 20 days from now, Bezod Hashem. Rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan says, Kasha Tarbut Ra'a Betoch Beto Shel Adam Yoter Mi Milchemet Gog Magog. A degenerate child in a person's home is more painful and severe than the future war of Gogu Magog. Where is this coming from? Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. Talks about Gogu Magog. Talks about the war before Mashiach arrives. Talks about the extraordinary suffering that will happen at that time. And yet, Rabbi Yochanan says that a degenerate child, a bad kid, is even worse, more painful to people than this war will be. Where did he learn it from? King David, chapter 3, verse number 1 in Tehilim, in Psalms. A song of David as he fled from Avshalom his son. Le David ipne Avshalom bno. David the Melech, King David, the righteous among the righteous, sings, sings to HaKadosh Baruch Hu with bitter tears as he runs away from his own son Avshalom that's trying to kill him. The wayward child that he had. And immediately after that, says Rabbi Yochanan, it's written that David said in regards to his degenerate son Avshalom, Hashem, Rabim Kamim Alai. Hashem, how many are my tormentors? 
Many rise up against me. However, concerning the war of Gogu Magog, it's written in Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, also King David. Why do the people gather and the nations talk in vain? Whereas here it's not written how many are my tormentors. Meaning that when David the Melech describes the suffering and agony that he has from Avshalom, he says it's even worse than the suffering and agony that people are going to feel from the war of Gog Magog. So here we see that this precious baby that turned into Rabbi Yochanan tells us Rabotai, Jewish intimacy is not a joke. The fruits you will create, it's not just about them being good fruits, amazing fruits, delicious fruits, cute fruits, smart ones, precious ones, lovable ones, righteous ones, not just that. I can assure you that no matter how religious you are, you don't want that rotten fruit. You don't want that rotten fruit, but because the pain that the parents have from rotten fruits is the worst pain imaginable. Because those kids, they don't stop torturing the parents. It just simply grows over time. And it gets worse over time. Now, for some of us, everything I just said is enough. Enough to motivate us, enough to inspire us to at the very least try, try to make the intimacy in our households more holy, more connected to God, more connected to the mitzvah. Certainly ju just as pleasurable, but require more effort. But for some of us, they need a little bit more. So this last part is simply a reminder of the obvious, which is whether you choose to follow what the Ramban is saying and exert a little bit more effort in your intimacy to make it holy and not just pure lust in order to produce more holiness in the world, more connection to God, and needless to say, better fruits. Or you're going to listen to the evil inclination that says, listen, it's too hard, it's too this, it's too that. What do you need all this for? Even though it sounds good, even though it looks good, it's just too much. The reality is, you will be exerting that effort on your kids anyway. Why not exert it when it matters most before they come? What do we do for our kids? It's not a question. It's what don't we do for our kids. There was a famous rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Scherer. Rabbi Moshe Scherer was one of the pioneers of American Judaism. He was the head of Agudat Israel for nearly four decades. And he built American Judaism in, to what it is today at a time where you barely could find a Jewish school. You could barely find a Jewish kindergarten. You could barely find kosher stores. And all of a sudden, this Rabbi Moshe Sherer comes along and he's making partnerships with different government members of the people in America. Different mayors, different governors, has conversations with Congress, gets funding, gets permission, gets all types of things to put Judaism on the map in a very favorable way here in America. And he did it at a time where people literally couldn't believe that he was able to do one thing, needless to say, decades of it. And one day, after he succeeded with all of these massive, massive relationships and undertakings to build 
American Judaism, the, the, the infrastructure of American Judaism, orthodoxy is what I'm re- referring to, some rabbis came to him and said, how did you do it? How did you do it? I mean, it was a time that literally you couldn't even talk to anyone in government that you wanted to open a synagogue. If you wanted to do it, you just had to do it. What make sure nobody found out? You couldn't convince people to give any type of funding to open a yeshiva. People didn't want to go to yeshiva. You couldn't even convince people to to keep Shabbat in some cases. How did you build all of this during that time? It says it all started with a woman, a widow, and her baby. everyone's paying attention woman a baby did you help this woman he says listen i'll tell you the story he says many years ago there was a widow from religious jewish woman that cleaned houses in order to provide for herself and her baby and she worked very very hard but in those days there's just so much you can make cleaning houses I don't believe that much has changed today. But she said she would make $3 per month. And that was enough for her and her baby to live. Now one day, she wakes up in the morning and she sees that her precious child suddenly has become red all over his body and infections similar to abscesses are coming out of his skin bursting scary like one of the plagues of egypt is happening here she obviously she is dumbfounded here what's happening she calls her neighbor to see this her, her neighbor knows a few things about medicine and says listen this is not a this is this is not a small cold this is not uh Chicken pox, this is something serious. You need to go to an expert. There's an expert. He lives several blocks away. He does house calls. In those days, they still used to do that. Only problem is he's very expensive. He takes $10 per house call. It says this lady that makes $3 a month cleaning houses. Doesn't hesitate. Gets the address of this doctor. The charge is $10 per house visit and runs towards him. She finally arrives where he is and she tells the doctor, you need to help my son, please come. The doctor says, fine, you have the money? She goes, don't worry, I'll pay you, just come. You need to save my son. The doctor was also a religious Jew. Got up, came to the woman's house, he sees this sick baby and he says to her your baby is in very big danger i'm very familiar with this disease that he has and he has a very very rare disease that i happen to know very well the problem is that the medicine for this disease is only made by one doctor that's anywhere near here and he's nearly an hour away from here and he's not cheap he charges $45 for this medicine and if you don't give your son the medicine in the next six hours I'm afraid your son is gonna die he says to the woman from the looks of your house you don't have the $45 now I'm willing to give up the 10 that you owe me because I know you probably don't even have it. And I hope and pray that you somehow succeed in coming up with the money to pay this doctor because he's not Jewish. So he's not going to be so kind to you. Especially not with a $45 medicine that he's the only one that has. The woman says to him, please, it doesn't matter, just, just, just give me the script, give me the script, tell me the address, I'm going there. 
Without hesitation, the doctor gives her the script. Graciously leaves without charging her the $10. And she calculates, I need to get there as soon as possible. She opens her purse to see how much money she has, only to find a few pennies. That's not even enough to get there by a bus. She has to go to this place by walking. But she realized she only has six hours. What can she do? She has to run. She has to go as fast as possible. But that's not going to be enough. So then she realizes she has to go through a section of town that no Jew dares going through at that time. A place called Harlem, where in those days was the criminal uh, criminal location, poverty, criminality, horror. Today, Baruch Hashem, it's developed. A lot of money has been put into it. A lot of good has come out of it. But needless to say, in those days, Harlem wasn't even 10% of what it is today. Going through Harlem in those days was 100% a life risk. But this religious Jewish woman didn't hesitate when she realized that she can get to this doctor within two hours if she goes through Harlem. And that's exactly what she did. And miraculously, she went through the entire Harlem without anybody stopping her. She got to this doctor. And she runs and she's frantic and she gives him the prescript. And tells him, my son, my son, my son. The doctor says, okay, okay, lady. Just tell me he sees. Oh, this is what you want? Problem. You have $45? She says, I don't have $45. My son is sick. I need the medicine. He says, I'm sorry, lady. I'm not charity. The medicine is expensive. I'm sorry about your son. But if you don't have the money, I cannot give it to you. She says, please, just give it to me. I need it for my son. She says, I'm sorry, lady. I don't, I'm not going to give it to you. I can't do it. She says, is there anything else that I can do? Maybe you need cleaning. I can clean. And this non-Jewish doctor says, or pharmacist says, oh, psh, well, that's a great idea. You know what? My cleaning lady just quit. So I do need somebody to clean. But, I mean, how much could you possibly generate? I mean, you'd have to work for me twice a week for two and a half years for free. Just to pay for this medicine. You agree to do such a thing? Without hesitating, the woman says, absolutely. Give me a contract. I'll sign it. Just give me the medicine. The pharmacist slash doctor makes the contract, puts her name, $45, the equivalent of two and a half years of cleaning twice a week that she's committing to. In return for this medicine. He goes in the back, makes the medicine, and he gives her a bottle. He says, here you go. Quickly, without hesitating, she starts running back home. Time's running out. We only have three and a half hours left. She starts running, and again, she goes through Harlem. But this time, Somebody does stop her. As she gets through it, at one point she's about to turn a corner and some drunk thug attacks her, jumps on her. Says, give me all your money. I need to get some more alcohol. She says, I don't have. He grabs her purse, opens it up. He sees there's nothing there. Angry, throws it on the floor. And then he sees that this woman has a bottle with liquid in it. Some red liquid. Immediately he grabs it from her. Opens it up and starts drinking. Within a few seconds, he spits it at her. And out of anger from the disgust, he throws it right next to her. And it smashes all over the floor, all over her dress. 
the $45 medicine, she just committed two and a half years of her life is gone. Her baby is about to die. She doesn't have time to cry, to feel bad for herself. She quickly breaks away from this drunk, disgusting excuse of a human being that attacked her and runs back to the pharmacist. Arrives at the pharmacist's door, complete mess of everything that happened. She says, I need the medicine. It broke. Listen, you need to just give it to me. He said, what? What, what happened? She said, no time. Just give me the medicine. He goes, you have, what do you mean? You don't have money. She said, I'll give you another two and a half years. Just give me the agreement. I'll give you another two and a half years. I need the medicine. It's three hours left. This pharmacist doesn't mind getting five years worth of cleaning for free. He says, no problem, I'll go make you the medicine. He goes, makes the medicine. Right before he gives it to her, he starts smelling. He goes, what is that smell? He says, I don't know, just give me the medicine. He goes, no, 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 there's something, something smells here. What is it? She has no idea what he wants from her. He starts smelling her. And then he sees on her dress. It's a huge stain in red. He says, what is that? She says, that's the medicine. The guy threw it on the floor and he spit it at me. And it stained my dress. The pharmacist, as soon as he got close to it, smelled it. His face turned white, and he fell back on his chair, completely baffled at what he just realized. The woman has no idea what he wants, what's wrong. All she knows is she wants this medicine that he's not giving her yet. The pharmacist then says to her, God must love you. She says, okay, great, can I have the medicine now? He says, no, you don't understand. God must love you because for the first time in my entire career, I made a mistake. I took the wrong bottle and gave it to you as a medicine for your son. Had your son drunk a sip of that medicine, he would have died instantly. And you could be assured that that thug that attacked you, he's dead already. Now, I've never made such a mistake like this. And I'm willing to rip up the contracts for five years and even give you this medicine for free. Just don't tell anybody what happened. Psh. No problem. Give me the medicine. She gets the medicine. The agreements are ripped. And she runs back to the house. In time within that six hours. To give our kid the medicine. He drinks it. He's cured. He lives. Now, the rabbis that are listening to this exciting story, they're amazed. They're excited. But what does it have to do with Aguda de Israel, the yeshiva world? What does it have to do with anything? It can make a good movie. Perhaps even a good clip out of this year. But what does it have to do with anything? It says to them, Rav Moshe Shel, you know that woman? I learned everything I know from her because she was my mother and I was that baby. My mother didn't care that she didn't have the money to pay the doctor $10. It didn't stop her from going there. My mother didn't think 
then it's dangerous to go through Harlem just to go find this medicine that she can't even afford. My mother didn't think twice about asking the doctor to give her the $45 medicine, even if that means she has to work for free for the next two and a half years. And she didn't care that somebody just attacked her and tried to kill her and let that stop her from going back to get the medicine again after the original medicine was broken. My mother didn't have time to celebrate that the miracle upon miracle that happened where the poison was destroyed and the original medicine was given. She just cared about getting that medicine. Do you know why my mother didn't care about all of those outside factors full of hurdles and difficulties and impossibilities? Because life was on the line. Her baby's life was on the line. There's no time to consider the difficulties. There's no time to consider the obstacles. There's no time to consider, oh, this hurts and that's hard and this is and this is not. And why does anyone help me? And why does this happen to me? There's simply no time for that. The only thing there is time for is to exert as much effort as we can based on the belief in the Creator that gave us this problem, that gave us this difficulty, that gave us this test. There's no need to be upset. Because this difficulty is also the will of Hashem. As much as the success and the blessing is the will of Hashem. My mother told me that story when I was a boy. And I lived my whole life with that in mind. Before every meeting, before opening any yeshiva, before any agreement, before asking for anything. When everyone was trying to tell me that this is difficult and this is impossible and this was never done before, the only thing I could think of is that none of this is anywhere near as difficult as what my mother went through that day. And she did it because life was on the line. How many lives are on the line right now? If we don't grow the yeshiva world, the orthodox Jewish world, if we don't bring the Torah to our children. You see, Rabotai Karim, if a person thinks about all the difficulties when it comes to Jewish intimacy, they're never going to understand the reward that they're getting. When they realize that the reward that they're getting certainly is beyond our comprehension and certainly is worth the difficulty you should always be reminded that difficulty will have anyway at least this time we're choosing our difficulty now we'll finalize with this one story a story that's going to remind us of perhaps the same thing in a little bit of a different way a story that happened around 50 years ago where a young couple living in Tel Aviv in the late 1970s completely secular completely oblivious of Torah mitzvahs to the extent where observing any holiday is not even an imagination And eating pig has become part of the day-to-day life, even in Eretz Yisrael. Now, he was successful, and his wife enjoyed all types of tastes and pleasures. And one day she calls him as he's at work, and she tells him, Honey, on the way home, can you get us some white meat so we could have a nice feast together? 
white meat. It's pig. Bacon. Or, I should say, ham. Sure. And this young Jewish man finishes work, goes to the store. He sees, sees that the store that sells non-kosher meat, including pig, has literally a line. A line. People waiting online to buy more. He waits online. And as he's waiting online, for the first time in his life, a story that he's known his whole life pops in his head. And it pops in his head, but this time it affects him in a different way than it ever did before. The story is about his grandfather. Where a man told him, a man that survived the Holocaust, a man that knew his grandfather, told him the story. He says, I was in the Holocaust with your grandfather. And your grandfather was a strong man with a lot of faith and although he wasn't an extraordinary Torah scholar he was a strong believer in God and towards the end of the Holocaust these evil Nazis took pleasure in torturing us even more by telling us we can leave Sometimes as a trap, sometimes as an excuse to kill us. And one day, as the war was coming to an end, these evil Nazis got a group of us together and say, Listen, you see that gate? All of you are allowed to leave after you see how horrible your beliefs are. Everybody's skinny starving, famished. The last thing they want is this Nazi evil monster teaching them anything about anything. But they have no choice. And the man tells this young man, this Nazi then grabbed your grandfather. He says to him, you, you, are not willing to eat what we give you. Well, let's see if that changes today. He brings a piece of ham and he says to him, eat this and you can go free with the rest of these Jews from that gate right there. He says, your grandfather said to him, I'm a Jew. I don't eat pig. The Nazi get even more angry than we've seen him. Grabs his gun, puts it to his head. He says, if you don't eat it, I'm going to shoot you in the head. But if you eat it, you can go free with the rest of them. He says, your grandfather again said, I'm a Jew. I'm not going to eat pig. Some of the people that knew him, that befriended him, we tried convincing him, just eat it, let's go, let's get out of here. He's letting us go. But he wouldn't budge. And after warning him last time, the Nazi... put the gun to his head and killed him. Your father, your grandfather, died on Kiddush Hashem. He believed in Hashem so deeply that he was willing to die not to eat pig. And this young man 
suddenly remembered this story years after he heard it originally. In the past, when he was a kid and he heard this about his grandfather, it didn't really move him. It was kind of weird. Why would you die? Just eat the pig. What's the big deal? It's even delicious. 25 years have passed. He hears the story in his own mind again. And he thinks to himself, how could this be that my grandfather was on a line, was given an opportunity to be free, to be alive, and refused to eat pig. But I am here in the Holy Land of Israel, in a store that sells pig, and I'm waiting online to eat what my grandfather refused to eat to the extent that he was willing to die for it. How could it be there's such a difference between us? Either he's crazy or I'm crazy. There cannot be such a difference. He got out of the line. He said, I'm not buying pig until I find out who is crazy. He came home. His wife said, oh, did you get the, get, did you get the food? He said, no. Explain to her what happened, what went through his mind. He says, I have to find out if he's crazy or not. I need to find out what is this, what, why didn't he eat it? He says, okay, I'm with you. Find out. Leaves the house and all of a sudden he sees, there's a sign, one of the walls over there, seminar about Judaism. Ask all the questions you want. No. He said, wow, this is a miracle. Where is it? Oh, it's tomorrow. He gets there. He sees, there's a few rabbis. And four other people. That's it. Nobody else showed up. There's as many rabbis as there are audience. The rabbis say, listen, we have a lot of experience and knowledge from all types of things. You can ask any question you want. And these five Jews start firing questions. How is there proof that God is real? What's the proof that the Torah is divine? What's the proof of this? What's the proof of that? Because each one of them was smarter than the next. And every one of them is getting answers. And this man was asking questions. Questions he's had his whole life. Questions he's never asked until now. And he's getting the answers. And after getting all of these answers and he says himself... Years later, when he tells a story, every question I ask, they had the answer. And each time they give an answer, my neshama calms down even more. I feel like I'm at peace, that something was solved, like a piece of the puzzle that was missing. And I ask another question, and they give me an answer. And the answers all make sense. The answers all have proofs and sources from the Torah. And after they answered all of our questions, I had one last question. When are you going to do this again? And the young rabbi said, we just started the seminar. This is the first one. We're planning on starting an organization and doing this more often. The young man says, I'll fund the whole thing. I'll pay for it. I'll be partners with you guys. That young man started an organization with those rabbis called Arachim. Arachim became renowned in the world at large. In Israel, in America, in Europe. Hundreds of thousands of people have shown up, have enjoyed, have learned from their seminars. Some of the greatest Kiruv rabbis throughout the last four uh, decades have been part of this organization, giving them, giving their people opportunities to go to heaven. Whether it was Rav Yagen, Allah Shalom, or many other rabbis, that literally 
were the greatest rabbis of their generation. Now that boy, or that young man, that used to eat pig, his name is Rav Yosef Valis. And he's the one that told the story of how he went from eating pig to being the founder of one of the most well-known cure of organizations in the world. Now who gets all the credit? Certainly he gets a lot of credit. Certainly those rabbis get a lot of credit. But you know who gets the biggest? That grandfather that died on Kiddush Hashem. The grandfather that didn't think that him dying for the sake of not eating a pig from some pig that's giving it to him was going to end up bringing the seed that will produce arachim, that will produce hundreds of thousands of balei tshuva, that will produce an endless amount of Torah. And he still did it, even without knowing all of the fruits that will come out from that single effort. If he's willing to do that without even realizing all of the fruits that he will get from it, all of the fruits that Hashem gave him as a result of that one act, imagine what our responsibility is when we do know the fruits that we can get, at least part of them, the fruits that we can benefit from in this world and the next. Helping people do tshuva, get closer to Hashem, is one of the greatest things that Hashem has ever given us. Being in the world of Kiruv is certainly a difficulty that is unlike anything else I've ever done. But when you see the fruits that helping people does, doing tshuva creates, the families that are built, the personalities that are perfected, the beautiful people that literally transform their lives just because of some words they heard me say in the name of the Torah. You see that even if this was the reward, Dayenu, it's enough. And guess what? The reward for helping people do tshuva is endless. The reward for achieving Jewish intimacy is also endless because each time can produce a whole new generation of righteous people that can publicize Torah. We're exerting the effort anyway to bring more good to those kids we want, we love, we need. The only thing that the sages are teaching us here is if you're already going to exert that effort, start early, before they come, before they're in the world, and you'll end up enjoying them for eternity. Thank you very much for learning Torah with me. Bezat Hashem, tomorrow we'll continue our questions and answers series called Stump the Rabbi, where I'll take all the questions you guys have. Perhaps we'll make it a longer lecture. And Bezat Hashem will learn how to get closer to Hashem, how to address some of these questions that all of us have in mind in order to serve Hashem even better. For now, I think we've achieved our purpose for today of getting excited, motivated, inspired, and a little more knowledgeable about why it's worth it to do what our Torah teaches us to do when it comes to Jewish intimacy. Thanks again for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you with lots of success in your life, especially when it comes to serving Hashem and achieving holiness in your lives. Kol tu b'chavaz l'cha. Thank you.